Today we're going to talk about three tips for growing a passionate online community. And I have a very special guest today. Daniel Brigida works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and she also has worked at the National Wildlife Federation. I say here amazingly wonderful because Danielle is one of the few um, leaders of social media in the nonprofit space. So she's been instrumental in bringing the National Wildlife Federation over the period of eight years out of the dark ages from a fortress nonprofit to a networked nonprofit that really listens to their community and pays attention. Danielle, Beth Cantor, Wendy Harmon, and a few other people that I can count on both of my hands that have been instrumental in really changing how nonprofits think about using social media. So with that, I'm going to uh, welcome Danielle, and Danielle's gonna talk about three tips here. We're gonna start off with the very first one, which is listen. The first step is identifying who your community is, and, and maybe if there is a discrepancy between who your community is and who you'd like them to be, the first step is really understanding what, what to do. So listening on social media is actually quite easy, and John has tips on it. You know, there are certainly different articles you can read up on for how to listen on social media, but the great thing about it is it's not rude to listen <laughs> on social. Um, it's actually a really good, important tactic. And, you know, I think a lot of people see it as, oh, this is something you can do if you have a ton of time, but there's no time for it. But I actually would argue that um, this is the most important piece of social media, and it's one that brands in particular, they tend to see it as, you know, social media is this place where you push content. But creating a community online is really about listening to them and, and, and filling that need that they're looking for. So. You know, when I first got here, there was a lot of emphasis on um, on the Facebook pages and the Twitter profiles and things like that, um, and making sure there was enough content out there. But there was less of a kind of look at listening. And I think that's pretty standard, and I think it's something that we forget. But there are some really great ways to listen. So um, that's my first tip. <laughs> if you want to go to the next Absolutely, um, yeah. I love that. Now, listening, <laughs> I always think of listening yeah. as the first step, period, because yeah. the community has the control. They now can talk about, uh, you know, the nonprofit, whether the nonprofit likes it or not. And it's really important to kind of start where they're at. And that's the basic of, I, I guess, the basis of any good relationship is to, you have to kind of listen to someone if you want to um, win them over as a supporter and understand where they're coming at so that you can um, speak to them in a way that's going to make sense. That's how I think about exactly. listening. But yeah, yeah. listening is so, it's and very underrated though. It's like a nice to have, like, oh yeah, if we can get to it, we'll listen to people. Meanwhile, we're just going to keep spewing content at them, you know? Yeah, and if, and if you're interested in the community, listening to people is, is definitely one of the, the best ways to get to know what they're looking for. And I think that's where you get to the actual meaning of listen, which is to then make sense of it. You know, it's not just mm. hearing what people say, but looking through all the feeds, because sometimes they don't know what they want. Mm. Um, I, found, I found this at uh, National Wildlife Federation. People were mentioning one of our programs consistently, um, but we were never promoting it. And so in my head, I made a note and I was like, there's a community there. And I worked with a couple people at National Wildlife Federation. We created this gardening for wildlife community and it became more active and engaged than our national community because it was the subset of very passionate people. Um, so sometimes, you know, when, when you listen, it can be kind of this, you're looking across multiple mentions of your organization or um, of your topic area and you see trends and then you can pick those out and actually make a community around them. So it's kind of a, it's, it's definitely a tactic I lean on a ton and I don't see it as a, a luxury as much as some people do. I see it as a necessity. So. Mm, you're right. Yeah, that's because the marketing um, job description is still mm -hmm. get the word out. That's the job description right. for most marketers is just to get the word out. You know, but then the question is, well, what word should we get out? Well, let's listen to people and find out what word they're already talking about. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, let, me, let me go to number two then. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this this one actually surprised me um, because before I was managing communities, I kind of saw rules as, you know, oh, I don't want to be a policeman, I don't want to be somebody who, um, but actually having 
community standards, a, com a commenting policy, um, those things are good to have in place and they give your community managers the, um, the ability to go in and say, hey, you're actually, you know, by, by being this insulting or, you know, by attacking somebody else, um, you're actually breaking community guidelines and that allows you to kind of step in and what I found, and again, I don't know why this surprised me, but it did. If you go in and you monitor comments and if you respond to people, um, you just, you get higher quality content. So I know there's a lot of concern about censorship and that's not what I'm talking about necessarily. What I'm talking about is reading through each comment and if it's inappropriate or disrespectful to other people who are commenting, um, that's when I'll go in and I'll assess it. Like I, I usually don't mind um, if somebody's upset with us. I usually see passion as more um, something I can work with than apathy. But what I do have a problem with is when they're being disrespectful to one another or when they're just commenting. And what I found is if you keep the quality comments and you pay attention to those that are actually quality comments, you can actually um, really start working with the community. And, and when I first got here, the person who had been doing the, the community was really doing a favor. She was doing a great job at it. Um, but she wasn't going through and, and she just didn't have the time to really read through the comments and, and, you know, break down what people were getting at. And so that was one of the first things we kind of did was really make the comments a, a meaningful place. And we could do that because we had rules, because we had this standard. Um, and then I just included this back and forth because, you know, especially now working for government, um, we, we do get yelled at a lot. People feel very um, upset and so most of the time our um, our different field offices don't respond in that way but this person had a good sense of humor so I threw it up there because um, when we corrected them they were like oh. it's brilliant. anyway I love I it the, <laughs> I love your response I honestly I love it because it basically says that this is something that you would not expect from a government organization which is a sense of humor okay yeah well, exactly, and it's we want people to know we're reading these things. Like real human beings are reading your comments, you know. More. That's and so I think awesome. That, <laughs> I know. <God. laughs> but but I, and I mean, this person was clearly upset with us, or maybe uh, the other thing that happens to us a ton is people get confused with which, you know, w who we are and what we do, and that's part of our that's part of our problem. And so one of the big things that I can do on social media is dispel myths, right? Is is make sure that people aren't propagating these things that aren't true. Um, but one of the one of the hard things to do is, you know, keep comment like people if there's no comment monitor monitoring or if there's no community manager, um, and that's kind of what I'm saying with this slide is is have a community manager that will go in and make sure that things stay respectful and and useful, right? I mean that's ultimately what you want. And I always I was always kind of against rules, but um, I do feel like this is something that plays a huge role in that. And just having like very simple commenting policy, like, you know, or, or community standards, those things set the tone for what, what you're going to have in your community. So. Yeah. And actually um, the National Wildlife Federation's Facebook page has a great, this is for everybody. They have a great example of a, a Facebook commenting policy. If you go into the about tab on their page, you'll find a great example of, um, a comment policy that you can kind of steal and you know totally make your it. own. Um, <laughs> but what I like about a comment commenting policy is that um, it's great for the community, like you're suggesting, but it's also great for the organization because then the organization is forced to answer the hard questions, which is, well, what type of discuss, what, what type of community, what's the tone, what's the environment, what's the uh, personality of our community, and also where's the line. Um, when do we ban a user? When do we delete a comment? Um, you know, and when do we take something offline? So just having the, that clear policy is it that is a huge time saver. Ab yeah, absolutely. And um, and there are some great examples out there of of that. And I will say, you know, rarely rarely does it come to banning. <laughs> Usually, you can kind of scold somebody and they'll back off. Um, uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's good to have that in place so that it protects the community manager too. 
Mm, so, yeah. So it's good. I've been yeah. doing a lot of blocking lately with all this political discussion on Facebook. Oh, all my, yeah. Uh, all my, uh, I'm learning a lot about my friends' political views. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, so do you want to go to number three? Yeah. That's okay. Great. Here we go. Um, so then the, the third tip is something that I, I don't know, I, I stand by, but it's Whatever community you're forming, whatever you're pulling together, um, you definitely don't want to lose heart. Um, you want to have heart in what you're talking about. And then also I threw in content because one of the great things about communities um, or as you engage with people, you're going to start getting ideas and you're going to start figuring out, oh, wow, we could really um, kind of, I guess one of the best ways to engage the community is to show that you're using their ideas. And that when they come and talk and they share experience and, and thoughts, that you're actually using them to then inspire new content. And that's something that we've really tried to do since starting at um, US Fish and Wildlife, or that I've been trying to do, but that they've been doing for a while, um, is just hearing what they're interested in. And again, it goes to, to both kind of an active asking them, but sometimes not asking them and just paying attention to what they, what they do in the analytics that you have. or um, you know, based on how they're responding to things. So these are just two examples. Um, we knew that people may not know that U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has the, manages the Wildlife Forensics Laboratory, um, which is a place where they actually receive animals and, and um, do all sorts of work on solving wildlife crimes. Uh, so we did a whole webinar or we did a live broadcast with a lot of our scientists from that. And so that was us trying to say, we hear that you have questions about this. Here's a way to um, engage with us on that and ask more questions and kind of, it gave us a chance to create content around what people were actually interested in. Um, and we do that a lot actually using our blog as well. well. We'll notice what's trending in the media and we might do a little bit of a deeper dive into the, the reasoning behind it. Um, I, I, I guess it was probably a few months ago, a bobcat caught a shark. <laughs> near one of our national wildlife refuges. And, you know, the news media was picking up because it's kind of strange and odd. Um, but we were able to go in and, and actually talk about why that wasn't that strange, but why the bobcat would maybe catch a shark. <laughs> um, and go in and, and explain it a little bit deeper for those who are interested. So constantly being relevant <laughs> is a huge part. Um, and not losing sight of the fact that your community is there because they care. And so even when they're upset or even when they're mad, um, you know, don't shy away from that. Look into that. Figure out what the passion is behind that. And then use that to then um, create good content for them. And that's, I think, what you do, John, really well is you lean into kind of what people want to know and how you can empower them. And that's ultimately what a community is about. It's about empowering people. So for me, when, I, when we work on our community at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it's about making sure people feel connected to us and know um, the service part of our work, but also really know the wildlife that they, that they have right here. <laughs> so, um, so now I have a question about the, um, the bobcat and the shark. Um, what were the charges? Because, you know, hurting a shark is not a good thing, right? So that's is, true. Is the bobcat still yeah. <laughs> The bobcat, um, yeah. No, uh, <laughs> he ran off. Actually, the shark lived. Um, the okay. shark went back. Huh. Um, it was just a photographer like walking back and forth on the beach and saw a bobcat catching a shark, took a photo of it, and then I think it, that spooked the bobcat enough to like drop the shark and go. But it was probably too big for him. So. Wow. Um, but no, this, job, this, this slide shows also like we experiment with new tools like Periscope and others. Um, and so we're using it to just try and connect people to our work that might seem far away. Mm. Um, based on what they're interested on or in. Yeah, okay. and I love the forensic lab. Like that is really something, again, like uh, the other example you showed, something that's very specific. You shared the example about the, um, the people who are gardening for wildlife, you know, the wildlife gardener people. Yeah, um, yeah. There's people that are interested in wildlife, but also they want to geek out on forensics. Oh, definitely. Right? And I think... Yeah, I mean, solving wildlife crime is, is a big part of our job. So we have a whole law enforcement arm, um, both for our refuge system, and we have a law enforcement for 
they're, they're stationed at different areas across the country to make sure people aren't bringing in illegal wildlife. I guess paraphernalia is the best word. I don't really know. Yeah, um, that happens it's, a lot in Florida, amazing. though, doesn't it? I mean, I, I yeah. do a lot of because I I work I work for a bunch of uh, Everglades organizations in Florida, and they have a there's a big thing with with uh, crime. Um, I guess animals that are not native, they they're mm -hmm. they're there. There's snakes running all over the woods yeah. and everything like that. They're trying to get, a tr get control of these creatures. You know. Yeah, and that. and it, it does. Yeah, and that that's like a whole other issue too with the invasive animals. So there's there's a lot going on um, that maybe people don't know about. And so if you've got a passionate community who cares about these issues, in finding ways to connect with them on it, I mean, I think that that's one thing that we all have in common. We're all like trying to um, bring to light some, some things. So starting with passion and yeah. kind of figuring out how to engage it in a meaningful way, you know? Yeah, the other thing that I notice about you, Danielle, is that um, <clears throat> you truly are passionate about your work. Um, I don't know if anybody knows this, but uh, Danielle's really passionate about bats. And I remember you told me this a while ago. You said you like bats because most people don't like bats. They're not like the cute little, you know, cute little animal. Bats are kind of creepy looking. You know, people are scared of them, but you... You really, uh, you know, geek out on bats, and you go on these, uh, in, uh, what do you call them, uh, trips with your bat friends, and you get into <laughs> studying bats. I don't know. Maybe you can. You'd probably be able be able to articulate that better than I can. <laughs> well, I think I think they're they're the animals we we like for various reasons. You know, they're cute and all that stuff. And I, I think the what I liked about bats was the more I learned about them, the more. I found them interesting, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, they, I think they are cute, but, but I think like, um, I think being passionate about the community you're bringing together is actually a huge thing. And when I look for building a team or, you know, like looking for volunteers or people who are interested in community in building a community, um, you, you want to have that underlying curiosity and that underlying passion around the topic so that you can explore together. You know, it's not me, telling you what to do on our Facebook page. It's us discovering things together, right? And so Yeah, yeah. Um, and that and that's how I feel with bats. I was always discovering stuff. And that's it's funny because for an animal that they are you know, there are multiple species. I think we have about forty seven or eight different species in this country alone. Hmm. Um, I could be I could be off by a few. But but I think the the point is there there's species diversity um, with bats, and we still don't know so much. And that's kind of what's neat about wildlife in general is if I'm doing my job well, they're living their lives out there, you know. Um, so it's kind of a neat thing to think that they're doing well. Yeah, you wrote a blog post. I forget what the website was, but it got into bats, right? I forget which website that was. But um, th there was one um, kind of factoid oh. or interesting um, thing about the bats, if they help out, they help each other, right? So in a yeah. group, if one bat is hung, and I don't know if this pertains to only a specific species or just a few, but if a bat, a group of bats are trying to eat and one poor bat can't figure out how to get the food, another bat will come along and say, hey, here's my food, and then he'll throw up in the, the bat's mouth. Which yeah. Is mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a vampire bats will do that. Actually, yeah. so that's about um, you know that's it's interesting because that's about empathy and compassion, something that we normally think is limited to human beings, right? But more and more, I think scientists are discovering that that um, moral um, qualities and you know like compassion, and empathy are actually in uh, many many animals. Yeah, you know? well, it's definitely. I mean, it's an interesting. It's interesting when we can start to watch how these animals behave and how altruism and how um, that actually helps them survive, you know, and bats are definitely a species that are very social, um, you know, they they, were, they need their family, essentially, but... Um, I'm reading you know, a great book right now. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, no, go ahead. You, no, I was just going to say, um, just along that line, um, I'm reading a book, you probably have heard about it, it's called The, the Bonobo and the Atheist. Or the eighth mm. bonobo, and I, I'll, yeah. I'll send you the author's name. But basically, his argument is that um, morals are something that is kind of in in our evolution as a species, and and actually, 
uh, the author's pointing out how a lot of mammals have this quality of caring and nurturing and protecting the community and making sure each other's well fed. And he, he actually compares chimpanzees with bonobos. Um, <clears throat> so in the Congo, oh, wow. in the Congo in Africa, um, there's a river, of course, that divides the, the country. And um, on one side, the chimpanzees, and that's a, a patriarch, you know, run by the men, and they often kill each other if things are, if there's a conflict, they go to battle and they fight each other. Meanwhile, on the other side, there's bonobos, which was not really a chimpanzee, but they kind of look alike. Um, they look like a chimpanzee, but they're smaller. <clears throat> and whenever they have a conflict, they encounter a different group of bonobos in the forest. They have uh -huh. they have orgies. They literally just start having uh -huh. sex with the uh, with the other group, and it's totally <laughs> peaceful. And so his argument, his he's kind of raising this question: uh -huh. of where, you know, you know, where you know, there's a different way to resolve. Uh, there are different ways to resolve conflict in the world. It's not always through violence, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. he's not—he's not condoning that human beings should go out and have orgies and, and everything is fine. But it's just interesting that those—that that's an adaptation that 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 bonobos have that chimpanzees don't have, but they're so closely related. You know? yeah. yeah. Well, I—I I mean, I think that that you know, looking at how a different animal survive. I remember I read a, a paper on um, a, a species of desert lizard um, that never, they're not aggressive at all because they just have so few resources and um, they want to conserve all their energy. So when they do territorial displays, it's basically like a look in the other person's direction. <laughs> so, um, it's just kind of interesting to think like, you know, they're, there's definitely a way to coexist and, and live together and keep, yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that that's, um, it's something we can definitely learn from some of these animals, so. Mm, mm. Yeah, I'll, but, have to, uh, I'll have to send you info on that book. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I mean, I, I see communities as very similar to ecosystems, you know, just how they all need to work and you need to have a niche and you, you want to be strong in your diversity and your function. So, yeah. um, so I, that's kind of how I pull it together. <laughs> exactly, but. yeah. So um, we have, I think we have a couple of questions here, mostly comments, though, and I'll just read them. Um, let's see. Trisha says, hooray for bats. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Trisha says she loves bats. And then Norman uh, Reese, who's in New York, uh, Norman says, Daniel, I saw a bats exhibit earlier this month at the Nature Preserve in Long Island. Fascinating. Uh, Norman, oh, cool. actually, I'll be on Long Island this weekend for Thanksgiving. Long Island, I'm gonna I'm gonna go see my brother. Um, and then Norman says, wishing you both a wonderful Thanksgiving. You're very welcome. Trisha says bats are vital to our ecosystem. And Norman says, sounds like an interesting approach when I was talking about the orgies. So I think those are all the <laughs> <laughs> these are all the uh, those are all the comments for today. Um, and it's now 11:30. So thank you everyone so much, and thank you especially to especially to the, Danielle. Really appreciate it, and I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks. You guys, too. Take care. Okay. Bye, everybody.